with that, I'm going to uh, open us up with our opening talk. Again, this is uh, top five trends in ICS, industrial control systems from 2023, also known as what I can cover in less than 30 minutes. So I have about 25 minutes left. I overachieved. I have way too many slides to actually cover that in 25 minutes, but I'm going to do my best. The top five that uh, we are highlighting here, industrial control system targeted malware, and I'm going to have a slide or two on each one of these to try to convince you that these are problems you're facing or that you will face. ICS targeted malware, industrial cloud integration, supply chain issues in ICS, industrial control system incident response maturity, and last, regulation. Those five things are definitely more on the rise throughout 2023 than they have been in previous years. And specifically, if we look towards industrial control system targeted malware, as you consider the different things that we've seen, kind of collections of industrial control system opportunistic malware attack campaigns that have made their way into uh, process environments and impacted them, not Petya, Configure, Black Energy 3. If you look towards industrial control system themed attacks, the Dragonfly 2 campaigns, industrial control system tailored access, so Black Energy 2 and Havex, and then moving into tailored effects with Crash Override, Trisis, Indestroyer, Indestroyer 1, Indestroyer 2, Indestroyer X, the variations of the Indestroyer malware that are impacting Ukraine specifically, and the latest with Pipe Dream. As you start to look at those different attack campaigns and you look at how we defend these items in this top group is generally where you'll hear kind of good cyber hygiene, passive defense, governance standards, regulation, those things in the bottom, specific targeted process attacks is where you're leaning more towards from a defense perspective, the need for operational resilience and cyber engineering and an active defense approach. So some of you who are in 515 this week or in 410 or especially in 612, you're starting to look towards what can you do in that bottom half to better position your system, even if there's a successful attack. So if an attack comes, adversary has success, but you're engineering or designing your environment in ways where they have less su success on impacting it. If you look at what we've done across the past years, we have seen more and more and more impactful attacks in recent time. So this is definitely on the growth trend. And as you look at where those sit in a variety of different charts. So this is a map that we made. And when we first made it, there was two or three things on this. We update it consistently. If you're a member of our ICS forum, we post this whenever there's a new thing that comes. So an ongoing image where you can look at the industrial control system impact from low to high, and you could look at the level of industrial control system customization. And in general, as you're seeing more things appearing in the upper right, that's not good news. That means they are more customized and more impactful. Some of the two newest are in odd placement here for two reasons. So in Destroyer, for those who have not, uh, you're not familiar with it, it had another name, so same piece of malware from the Ukraine 2016 transmission system attack. It was also called uh, Crash Override. So Crash Override and Indestroyer, that piece of malware from 2016, had tons of capabilities and tons of uh, modules. Indestroyer 2 is a variant of that that has less capabilities. It is more site-specific, and it is deployed at a site compiled days before execution, and it operates the breakers at that specific substation uh, only. So it's custom made for that site. Usually it has something to do with troop movements or some strategic goal. So there are many variations of it for every site that it's going to impact. So less impactful than the crash override versions because they've taken some of the features away, but directly enabled strategically for troop movements or uh, other types of uh, goals for the adversary. Pipe Dream would probably be in the upper right if it had been executed and released, meaning this is a piece of malware that was discovered in development and made available for defenders around the globe to start looking for it, defending against it, and understanding what its indicators of compromise would look like. So it was a tough one to place on this map because it was never used. That doesn't mean it won't be used and some variant of it wouldn't be used or some customization of it wouldn't be used. You should think of this as a framework of tools and capabilities for multiple targets. Um, since it wasn't used and didn't have an actual impact, we sort of put it in the middle. But um, these decisions have to be made with every single campaign or piece of malware that comes. We place them on the map, and then we uh, post this to our community forum. 
So as you're doing education and outreach to your executives or your teams, feel free to download some of these slides that we put out to the forum and we continuously update them. That is the topic of ICS malware. It is growing, it's a problem. If you weren't aware, I hope you become more aware in your classes this week, but uh, we will move on to the next piece. The next piece is industrial cloud integration. There are a number of things to talk about here, but I'm gonna ask you to hit the snooze button because we have a panel that is going to talk on this directly. And since I have limited time, I am not gonna spend a second on it here. So this will be covered more shortly. The next piece that I wanted to talk about is supply chain risk. And this is one of those that as you think about this growing problem, I don't know what part immediately comes into your mind from the forging, the design, the fabrication, the uh, software that's on some of the solutions that you're purchasing, the operate and maintain cycles, the supply chain components that you have to consider are quite large. And there's uh, different stages of them that be could, could be more concerning to you based on your job role. But certainly as you think about things that have happened uh, in recent times, you could look to the chip level, you could look to the manufacturing of a product, you could look to software components, you could look to security solutions, you could look to managed service providers, you could look to your original equipment manufacturers. Um, supply chain is definitely a problem. And for anyone working in industrial control system space, it's a large problem. The solutions that people are talking about from an SBOM approach, from an HBOM approach, from knowing your inventory, all of those things are very, very important. But looking at operating your process day to day, minute to minute, you really, really need to understand how you're going to manage access and how you're going to validate the integrity of what you're bringing in the door and putting into your operating environment. Another growing trend, industrial control system, instant response capabilities and maturity. So as you've seen some of the impacts that have happened over time, Colonial Pipeline, not Petya and its impact on Marisk and Mondelez and others, uh, large maritime ports being uh, impacted, um, electrical grids being impacted. And you think about many organizations as you go in and talk to them about their capabilities, often they refer to incident response plans and those incident response plans are focused on IT systems. And as you look at issues like these, in many cases, we have systems that are clearly IT systems, we have systems that are clearly OT, and then you have a number of things that are in the middle. The impactful systems like ERP, manufacturing execution systems, and others where in the Colonial Pipeline attack, their compressor stations, their pump stations, their valve stations, their SCADA systems, they were all perfectly fine. Their IT systems had ransomware events and impacts with DarkSide. And you had these systems in the middle that understood what was in the pipeline and what product was coming in and where it was supposed to go out at terminal stations. So from a safety perspective, if they didn't know what the product was, they didn't necessarily want to put diesel into an airplane and they didn't want to put jet fuel into a car. So without knowing what the product was, um, they had to stop operations. So it was an operational impact. If you look to not Petya and Maersk, the ships and the port and the maritime operations and the ship to shore cranes and the movers on land for the containers all working perfectly fine. The industrial control systems, no problem. Their IT systems were impacted. The boats coming in, all the maritime vessels, no problem, perfectly fine. The issue is they didn't know what was in the containers. Many of these large deep port, they are 80, 90% of the product is coming in and transferring and going back out. So without knowing what was in the containers and where it was supposed to go, they had to stop operations. So it was an operational impacting event. And as you look at your incident response plans, do they address those types of systems that are in the middle? And then if we progress to an operational attack targeting ICS assets, does your IR plan actually address how you will recover and rebuild your PLCs, your engineering workstations, your operating workstations, all of those unique industrial control system elements? Regulation. This is one that as we talk about kind of the last trend that I will cover, I don't know that it would be a surprise to anybody that regulation continues to expand and grow. And it wouldn't be a surprise to anybody that that's gonna happen for the rest of our days. That NERC and NERC SIP specifically who have to deal with it, that will continue to grow. It's not gonna stop or shrink or reduce anytime soon. If you look towards uh, NIS and any of the directives occurring in the European Union and the requirements that are expanding there, expanding in the types of sectors that they impact from NIS 1 to NIS 2, 
and expanding in the requirements of what they need to cover. You look towards pipeline safety and the commitments from the White House in regards to pursuing more regulation for things along the lines of water, rail, transportation. You look to other countries and what they're looking to go implement for NIS or countries that are pursuing what they should be doing, areas like Singapore and other parts of the world as well. This isn't something that anyone has their eyes closed to. It's just a matter of how do we get it right? And there is a lot of different models that are out there and frameworks that are out there where people are trying to learn from each other to try to get this correct, where there's not a lot of money being spent on things that don't matter. But this is not going away and it's not getting any less. So as we get a chance to go around the world and talk with different uh, leaders from different sectors and CEOs of businesses, oftentimes they've been referenced to, we need to comply with IEC 62443. We need to achieve NIST, which would be like walking into the Library of Congress and saying, where's the answer? Um, they have an answer for everything. It's massive. So there is, uh, there's a lot there. And then of course there's regulatory environments where again, if somebody is told you need to comply with NERC, that is an entire regime of people that are compliance analysts, people that are security professionals, people that understand engineering operations. Um, it is a big team effort across the board. It is not something you start doing on one day. So often leaders of organizations will say, just tell us what to do. And myself, Rob Emley, both sat down, spent some time going through this and saying, Certainly, if you're regulated, you don't have a choice. You're going to have to comply with what you must do. But for all the other organizations and for all these companies and sectors that are being impacted that really don't have a guiding light and they don't have a, a true north and a compass to follow of what they have to achieve, what do you tell them? How do you prioritize the actions that they have to pursue? And in the IT sector, long ago, SANS built the SANS Top 20, if anyone is familiar with that. And over time, that has moved to CIS, and it's become the top 18. And we've said, what, what of those 18 things would we go recommend for OT and for ICS? And we started talking about it from the perspective of actual threat. What have we seen adversaries do? How have we seen different sectors being targeted? And what would we tell those organizations? Here's your top things that you should go pursue. If you have limited budgets, you're not going to have 47 different initiatives every year, and you're not going to continue to pursue that. So... We identified five items, one of them, ICS incident response capabilities, a defensible architecture, network visibility and OT monitoring, secure remote access, and risk-based vulnerability management. Just like the first five things, I will give you a slide or two on each of these five things in the next 12 minutes. So the ICS incident response um, of the top five, if you do nothing else, this is the thing to go do because assume you're compromised either at your IT side, and at some point that assumed breach territory will make a path into your OT side. So having a strong incident response plan is going to be really, really important at some point in time. Look across the scenarios that pose the most risk to your sector and your operations. Consider what those consequences will be when you're breached, and then exercise those things repeatedly. So your team can start preparing for what they will do when it happens, and they will start to identify what tools would help them to identify and respond quicker. So your incident response will drive what actions are going to be taken. Your exercises will drive what things will help your team if that big bad event actually occurred. Don't do scenarios that have nothing to do with you. Don't plan for horrible events, space aliens, meteors, earthquakes, uh, wildfires, all kinds of things happening at your data center, things that won't happen. Pick things that have happened in your sector that are realistic, believable, They've happened to other people. Read case studies so you can find out how the attacks were conducted at other organizations within your sector and then begin planning what you would do if it happened to you. There's key elements here that as we've worked through force on force, different uh, exercises, as we've responded to a variety of incidents in the ICS space in our careers, there's a couple of things on the identification side and a couple of things on the containment and eradication side that as you watch that happen and people are operating off of their IT plans, you can see through their IT plans, it's a hunt mission. Let's go find the adversary. Let's go find the offending IP address. Let's find what systems they're in. Let's eventually block it and contain it. Meanwhile, the process could be driven to complete destruction. In an OT incident response plan and those things, 
the identification that someone else is in your control system and someone else potentially has control of your control system, moving quickly to protect the process, either through manual or uh, control inhibit, that is the path you're going down, not hunting for an IP address. You need to focus on the process directly. So your OT incident response and those cycles will be dramatically different. You're on the other side, your preparation lessons learned and recovery will also be very, very different. So you need an OT specific incident response plan without question. If you don't have one now, uh, you are probably very poorly prepared for an incident that could happen within your facilities. Think of all the things on the recovery side that you would need. Don't just think of servers and network the way you would in an IT. Did we test this? Do we have these backups? Do we have these configs? Can we restore them? Do we have the media? Think of all the things you will need to do from firmware to program to configuration on your PLCs, your RTUs, your uh, system relays, your HMIs, any of the configs in your uh, sensors and how your system is actually operating. Understand that you need to recover that if it's misused or modified. Next, defensible architecture. I don't believe there has been a mitigation recommendation ever that didn't say segment your network. But what that means to every single person in this room is dramatically different, and it should be, because it's based on your process. It's based on what it's talking to, what it does, the risk, the real-time nature of it. Segment your network is a statement that you should do some things. What those things actually look like for you is dramatically different. As we talk about a defensible architecture, we're talking about having the capability to put and gather logging and make the environment defensible. Insert network visibility capability, have points of segmentation if you can detect an incident that's occurring and consider how your environment talks and should it be allowed to talk that way. When most people look at segmentation, it's guns out at the wall. It's at the farthest most perimeter pointing to what you know to be dangerous, the corporate business enterprise environment or the internet. Oftentimes it does not include all the things in between and all the areas that you could segment, including east to west within your process environment. Does one part of your process need to talk to the other part and need to talk to the other part and all of the other external remote connections? If it doesn't need to, can you segment it east to west, not just north to south? Network visibility. There's a couple of items here that we'll talk about. So just rapidly through these slides, doing visibility at this level, which is what most people have, that will give you some protection from attacks that are coming from corporate that pivot to OT, some remote vendor support that is coming through traditional VPN. Moving further in, you will begin to get some understanding of attacks that are targeting communications in and out of the ICS environment uniquely across the industrial DMZs into your operational environment. Getting visibility and detection at those two levels would be wonderful. And for some sectors, it's required. <clears throat> As you move further in, getting detection here, you'll begin to look at if an engineering or an operator workstation was compromised or being misused, or a transient cyber asset that has been walked right into the environment to do maintenance or work. You'll start to gain an understanding of attempts to misoperate or gather information so you could build a custom attack against an environment. Again, going further down, looking at supply chain, attacks direct over an OEM connection, straight into that level of your environment, and attacks that are really targeting effects on your equipment, so equipment damage. Detection at this level is where you'll begin to see that. There is capability to do detection at level zero. Um, depending on your environment, it may actually be justified and helpful. How you do it, and get that information out, especially if you're talking about a signal or a uh, serial communication, having a secondary device that has detection of serial and can communicate out, uh, out of band. That is adding some level of an attack vector into that space, but uh, it may actually be justified to see what's happening at that layer of your architecture. Very, very specific solutions and would be justified in very specific environments of extreme high, high risk. The main goal of all this is to reduce these gaps. So as you look across the compromise to detection gap, if you look across the detection to containment and you look at the containment to remediation, 
you want to make those windows as small and as tight as possible. As you think about, many of you have probably been in rooms and heard from different briefings that the normal attacker is in an environment for 18 to 24 months or extended time periods along those lines. The issue when you hear those statements is how long would they have been in? Because if I ask the, the average time that an adversary is in an environment, you'll say something that you've seen in your space or heard, 12 months, 14 months, 18 months. But the reality is that's not how long they were in before they were detected. That was how long they were in before they uh, kind of ended the hide and seek game. Meaning they ran an entire ransomware campaign and then told you all your files are encrypted, you owe us this money. You didn't detect them. They were, they were in a power system for 24 months and then they opened all the breakers and told you, we have complete control of the environment. We've severed your service delivery. That wasn't you detecting and finding them. That was the hide and seek game ended and they completed their mission. So how long could they have been in the environment is unknown, but they were at a point where they revealed themselves. We need to get to a point where we're closing those gap windows significantly. Secure remote access. I think this is something that all of us wish we didn't have to talk about. But as, uh, as you look at, if, if we were in FAA and there was a near miss or there was some type of an event, you have to learn lessons from every one of those potential safety risks. If you're a NERC operator or an electric utility, you have events analysis teams that look at uh, failures of the electric system and everyone has to learn from it. Here, in industrial control system and cybersecurity, we only have so many case studies to learn from. So we need to take advantage of every single one of them. And as you look at Colonial Ukraine 2015, VPN filter impacting the cl uh, chlorine facility in Ukraine, Oldsmar water, that's about half of the case studies that are available for us to talk about. Every one of them had a remote access component. So it is something that we have to focus on. And we have some unique issues specifically with industrial control systems. Meaning if you listen to the testimony from Colonial, they talk about their remote access VPN. And the solution that they were operating that they'd moved to was a multi-factor solution, but they still had a legacy single factor username and password that was shared and uh, unfortunately available on a couple of different uh, dark web and paste bin sites that the adversary used during the Colonial attack. In this space, in ICS specifically, if you have 280 or 300 different terminal stations that you are operating and they're in the middle of nowhere and your remote support people have remote access to it, when you get your brand new shiny remote access multi-factor authentication VPN capabilities day one, you don't turn off all the old systems day two. You have a complete transition window that could take a couple of years to test, validate, move everyone over to that platform so you're operating both in parallel for a period of time. Um, unfortunately, in some cases, that period of time is 10 years or more, uh, depending on what the solution and the technology upgrade is and how uh, in-depth and how much, how expansive it is. But that window, when you move to the new technology, you don't turn off the old instantaneously in industrial control system space. So we have this issue of longer term remote access problems. We also have a new issue, which uh, unfortunately happened during the pandemic. I can tell you from every place that I work and every place that I have worked around the world, we are operating our system in ways that we would have never allowed before from a remote access perspective. And it's an adversary dream come true. So new capabilities, new attack vectors, new ways in, um, largely because of pandemic, where we now needed to take the operator safety of potentially being exposed to COVID. And then we have no one to operate the system because they have to go home. You had to prioritize that. So all the other support personnel that used to be mandatory inside facility are now working remote. In a number of other organizations, the same. So all the support personnel, all the operations personnel, all working remotely in many cases because getting things was very difficult during pandemic. So operating from their home networks on non-issued company machines, um, operating from the same environments as their kids, PlayStations and Xboxes. So we are in a case where what we're doing for remote access absolutely demands an increase in network visibility. So you can detect bad things that are coming over those trusted communications. Again, when I say remote access, don't just assume VPN and support. Uh, consider all of the site to site communications that you have established throughout your organization and with partners. 
So suppliers into your space and people, customers that you're delivering product to. The last one we have, and I have 20 seconds, is risk-based vulnerability management. Don't trans translate this in your mind to patching. <laughs> Patching is one thing that you can do, and it's a very unique thing that you can do when it's appropriate for your environment. You have a, a uh, consideration tree, a decision tree to work through. This is from DHS that would now be labeled as CISA. Uh, I believe this came from DHS ICS CERT back when that was um, separate. The consideration here, the does the patch affect um, operations? is a workaround available. A whole decision tree on the risk to operations and then a path forward. If it's less risky to operate without the patch, continue to do so, otherwise work with operations to implement it. A piece here that I will highlight just from uh, uh, Dragos, they released a report. They're one of the few companies that goes and looks at all the industrial control system available vulnerabilities and associated patches. They do a bunch of analysis on it. In this case, it was 1,700 plus, and about 77% of those required you to be in the industrial control system network in order to take advantage of the vulnerability, which if you are the adversary and you are in the industrial control system network with the ability to direct communicate to the PLCs and to the operator systems, you do not need a vulnerability. So 77% of these that you would have been taking outages and downtime for to patch around doesn't take away any capabilities from an adversary. They don't get any net new capabilities with 77% of these identified and reviewed. So understand what the actual vulnerability is and what it means for your environment. And if it provides net new capabilities that could be impactful for your process, then maybe it makes sense to continue and move forward with patching. The last thing I'll say, and I'm already over time, is those five things are great, but we can't just tell practitioners, go do those five things. This needs some level of leadership support. They have to help prioritize. They have to understand the risk to the business. They have to provide staffing and training so that people can actually do these things, not from just a capital perspective, but from an operating and maintenance. Prioritize with operations, and then they have to understand that you are married to your vendors meaning this isn't just something that an entity can go do. You have to work with your vendors, your original equipment manufacturers. That is a marriage for life when you're operating that system. So you need their involvement. You need their buy-in in and how you're going to try to secure and defend this space. I think I will take one question from in the room, if there are any. And if you do wish to ask a question, I would ask that you'd use a microphone. Jennifer, is there anything in Slack? Potato gems. <laughs> the comment was they do not say tater tots in Australia. Just praise, no questions. That's wonderful. Okay. Well, I don't want to waste any time. We have food and beer, and we have a very, very capable panel that's going to be coming up next. So if there's no questions from the room, we will move to the one topic that I asked you to hit snooze on, which was industrial control systems and cloud. So with that, I would like to invite our three panelists up to the stage. And I believe we're gonna do a bit of a shift with some chairs and a table up here. So uh, if you'll give us one minute, we will do so. Thank you for paying attention to the talk, I appreciate it. <laughs>